Hello, I want to give you a short overview about the West Windsor Residents Association climate policy talking called Protecting Our Environment. So my name is Councillor De Costa. I am the independent lead for the Environment and Climate RBWM. And this policy has been born out of four years of research working with great institutions like the Centre for Alternative Technology, University of Reading, the Climate Party, Global Footprint Network, and the Stockholm Resilience Network. So we've been talking to professors, doctors, experts, climate scientists, physicists, ecologists, you name it, we've talked to them, to try and get a policy that really works and is credible from a scientific perspective. So this actually got the endorsement of the independent group from the Local Government Association, the Climate Party and Global Investment Advisors. So this is our summary. I'm going to tell you the summary. I'm going to go through it, and then I'll tell you the summary again. This is our hope. There is hope. You know, vote for De Costa and De Costa. There were two votes at the election on the 4th of May here in Clue and Deadworth West. So this is our mission, which is why you should vote for us. It's not just about, well, what should we say to get your vote? No, this is what we're about. We're going to be working with a new administration. We will help them set credible targets for net zero, for climate change resilience, biodiversity restoration, and for the elimination of plastics. We will drive change directly and indirectly through things like the corporate plan, through changing planning regulations, empowering residents, tightening the responsible investment policy for the Royal Berkshire Pension Fund, um, and reporting openly, really importantly, to report openly so you know if we're doing well or not doing well, and you can hold us accountable. And to collaborate, always. We're in this together, and I think together we can. So here's a quick overview of what RBWM can influence. So it's not just the spending of its own 100 million pounds and 50 million pounds. It's not even chucking, you know, the odd couple of million pounds or the other 10,000 pounds or so at climate change. We're talking about harnessing the entire machine. RBWM has an influence of 14.2 billion pounds. Let's break that down. So you look at direct spending. It has a budget, an annual budget to spend on services of 100 million pounds plus roughly uh, 50 million pounds a year it invests in capital projects. Imagine if all of that 100 million pounds, 150 million pounds had a focus or ha was every single penny was actually aligned with uh, environmental targets so that we knew that whenever we're spending our money, it is our cheery helping us achieve our targets. It's not the odd 5,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds, it's 150 million pounds. But we can go further. When we look at our planning regulations, especially our borough local plan, which specifies where things can be built and, more importantly, how they're built. We were talking about a billion pounds worth of development in the coming years. Again, buildings, digging up the ground. Imagine if all of that was climate neutral or rather enhanced our environment. And then we've got a wider look, pot to look at. Residents and businesses locally based on the ONS data for 2022, we have a purchasing power of about 11 billion, about three billion for residents and about eight billion pounds for businesses in Win RBWM, just in RBWM. Imagine if we could help these businesses and you choose the right products, the right services, which all help reduce our carbon footprint and get to where we want to be, not for us, but for our future generations. And the Royal Berkshire Pension Fund we have an asset base of two billion pounds there. I say we because I'm one of the trustees there and I've put through a responsible investment policy, which we'll talk about later. But it sits within a pool of other pension funds like the London Pension Fund of 14 billion pounds. Imagine if we lead the way and we can actually say to these guys, follow us or persuade them. Then of course, this all sits within the wider local government pension world which has 364 billion pounds of assets so there's a lot of impact that we can have as a local authority as rbwm with the right lead member for the environment and the climate and of course we will always be looking for grants 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 millions of pounds that the government will be releasing for residents and small businesses and local authorities to help them achieve the government's objectives not just our objectives but their objectives so let's talk about climate resilience. Well, the, the, the Met Office says it's going to happen. 
it is happening, it's actually worse than we expected. So if we know it's going to happen, why on earth aren't we preparing for it? I think we're being negligent if we're not preparing our buildings and our infrastructure and our residents for the future. So we need to identify the extreme weather patterns and then plan to prepare and um, actually uh, make our schools, our buildings, our roads, our IT infrastructure really able to cope with extreme weather. What sort of extreme weather? Well, we're talking about 40 degree heat. Well, that's normal now almost. 50 degree heat we're talking about. This is what's going to happen if we go up if we, as, uh, through the you know, 1.5 degrees, maybe even a little bit more. It's not what we want to do, but that's what's going to happen. Um, what about if all of our contracts, every single one of our contracts, especially our building contracts, have climate resilience built into them so we know that our children, our um, uh, adult care service workers are safe. We have to change the borough local plan. It's absolutely important so that the buildings are fit for purpose and they don't become the death traps of the future. We have to do that now. It's time for the borough local plan, much maligned, to be updated. We're supposed to change it at least, at least every five years. It's time. And here's the most important thing. If it's not in the corporate plan, a document which the local authority sets out, then it's not going to be included at all in any of our plans and purposes, in any of your evaluations. I call the corporate plan the strategy and policy document. That's the one ring to rule them all, if you know the Lord of the Rings. So we have to put climate resilience into that corporate plan to make sure that every single decision that we make has an evaluation of how that decision is going to help borough and its residents and its businesses and its infrastructure and its biodiversity and its environment be ready for the changes in the climate. Let's move on now to climate change net zero specifically. Now, we've looked at the impact of climate change and how we can prepare for the outcomes, if you like, prepare for the symptoms. But that's, now let's attack the cause of climate change. The IPPC, the UN, the JNCC, Parliament, 97, 98% of scientists around the world believe that this is caused by, globe, by carbon emissions. Sorry. So we need to target net zero emissions for 2030. Well, actually, we need to go beyond 2030, should I say. Because it's not about when we reach net zero, it's about the amount of carbon we throw up into the atmosphere between now and when we reach net zero. If the amount of carbon we put up into the atmosphere, which is causing global warming, causes us to go above one and a half degrees or two degrees, we failed. We've missed the mark and we're going to result in a, a situation with more extreme weather, more problems, more instability, political instability, food shortages from around the world than we need to. So we really need to talk about the amount of carbon that we're throwing into the atmosphere. And to do that, we need to measure what's our metrics. How much carbon are we emitting from all of our different areas of services and activities? And once we know how much carbon we're emitting, we can say, well, actually, how much carbon should we be emitting um, in that period of time? And let's accelerate as far as we can to make sure that we achieve one and a half degrees or lower. So we've talked about metrics. Metrics means reporting. How many carbons, tons of carbon are we emitting as a borough each year? How is that dropping down? How are we doing on Paris? Are we at one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees? We need to know. And we need to tell you residents so you can say to us, yes, no, that's good, that's bad. Or please put your, pull your finger out. And of course, we must include these metrics and this target for 2030 and staying within one and a half degrees in our corporate plan. Now let's move on to biodiversity and ecosystem restoration. Now we're facing the greatest biodiversity extinction levels since the great extinction of the dinosaurs, which is the uh, comet Club, as, as people say. Now, if you look at the slide up on the screen, the top one, this is presented to the parliamentary um, commission and it's from the JNCC and it talks about the abundance of biodiversity if you like uh, the number of species that are in existence in this country and you can see between 1970 and and to 2020 roughly the levels of species have dropped by 40 percent and that's alarming and we can't sustain this level of, of loss without actually heading for 
complete annihilation of high levels of species. So we need to do something about it. But what can we do? Do we just go for well, 10% net gain, a bit here, bat box here, or, or something, or a or, you know, great crest of newt there? No, we've got to understand how biodiversity works. Now, biodiversity, as you can see on the slide, has a hierarchy of needs. Humanity, that's us. We rely on oxygen, food, and well-being. We depend on biodiversity, on uh, on plants, on food, on for some of us. If you if you're or if you're not a vegetarian, then also meat as well. Now that those food stocks, whether they're plants or animals, depend on plants. And if you're a plant, you depend on decomposers, which live in the soil. So you know, nematodes, uh, fungi, bacteria, all of those sorts of things which contribute and provide the minerals for the plants to grow. But of course, all of this requires land, habitat, soil, acreage. So we need to protect habitat and green space. No more building on green space or green belt. No more extra tarmac and paving or even artificial grass. What's that about? We need to change our planning regulations and we need to make it very difficult unless you've got a really darn good project which provides an extra value for carbon or for biodiversity somewhere else or in some other way. No, we need to make sure that all of our projects are contributing towards our future well-being. But we need to create more habitat. So perhaps grand, uh, greening brownfield sites, urban greening. Uh, we need to put together a biodiversity assessment, looking at everything around the borough to say, look, well, what's our geology? What sort of... Um, habitat should be here and therefore if we know what sort of habitat what sort of species of plants and trees and bushes should we be growing here and should we be encouraging and then once that's in place you've got the green stuff in place the habitat in place you know that the animals and the high level species will populate and we can encourage that as well so we need to identify key areas for improvement look at massive amounts of tree planting and husbandry because it's not just about chucking trees here there and everywhere you've got to look after those things You've got to make sure that your net planting is a positive. And of course, plans for greening everywhere. So habitat creation is very important and has to be included in all of our contracts, our planning regulations, and of course, the corporate plan. Now let's move on to another aspect of in the environment that we can look at and focus on. There are many areas where, where the world is facing significant problems and you just have to go and look at the planetary boundaries report but we're going to look at the last of these that we're going to be focusing on uh, in this election for rbwm and that's the use of plastics and plastic pollution now there's a lot of plastic which is unrecycled it's not it can't be recycled but it's not recycled and these are polluting our land rivers our oceans our, and even our atmosphere we're finding microplastics actually in the atmosphere and when you look at the snow if you go to the, to the himalayas if you go to um, the Arctic or the Antarctic, microplastics are actually being found precipitating there. Now these microplastics and plastics cause harm to animals. The, the most sinister of all of this is the microplastics and the toxins that break down um, when these plastics hit the ocean. Now these are bioaccumulating food sources. What that means is that it will enter the system, it's eaten by um, a worm, which is then eaten by a bird, which is then eaten by another creature. Um, it's actually even found in, in some plants as well as, uh, as these come through the soil and through the uh, root system. So what happens next is that as you go up the trophic level, so up the higher levels of species, um, these values of microplastics accumulate and they get more concentrated and more concentrated, sooner or later leading to some sort of uh, physical health problem or even death. Now, if they're accumulating at the higher levels, we, you and I, are at those higher levels. So we're the ones, our children, are the ones who are going to suffer the most. It's already found to cross the placenta into the baby, from mother to baby, and also cross the blood-brain barrier and end up binding to red blood cells. It's a big issue. We need to eliminate plastics from our supply chains and contracts. It'll take time, but we need to set that as an agenda, set that as an objective, and get on with it. And of course, Prove it, prove it, prove it with measurements and metrics and a dashboard and open reporting to you residents. And of course, yes, include it in our corporate plan. Remember, if it's not in our corporate plan, it's not going to happen. 
Now, we also want to empower local residents and businesses. We've said that um, local residents have a purchasing power of three billion and local businesses another eight billion. So let's get some money from government. Let's help residents, let's help businesses with education programs and purchasing clubs where we find great resources. Let's enjoy um, economies of scale and reduced costs by coming together and buying things together. We'll put in place officers who a specific role is to look for grants, find grants, and then to create the policies and the programs so that you and businesses can benefit from those grants. The grants to actually reduce our carbon footprint and to achieve our other environmental objectives. Another very particular aspect we're going to be looking for is retrofits. Most of our energy, or about 40% of our uh, carbon emissions, come from the use of energy. Now imagine, if we can get money for retrofit so that your home, your, your building, your office uses less energy, your energy bills are going to drop as well as the carbon emission. So it's a win-win situation. So we're going to look at this together. Carbon reduction, carbon sequestration, retrofits, anything we can. We leave no stone unturned to get to a positive solution for all our residents and of course for future residents. And of course, this is going to be collaborative. We're here to listen to you. If I'm lead member, my door will always be open because we have to get this together. We're in it together. So I believe together we can. A quick talk about the Royal Berkshire Pension Fund. We've said that that's got two billion pounds worth of asset. It has the ability to influence uh, a 14 billion pound pool and even wider uh, industry. So we've put together or I've managed to put working with experts and working with some fantastic advisors, a responsible investment policy. It's a living doc document, a living policy, so it will get um, more powerful as you move along through the years. And it sets some of the key environmental targets which we already talked about. So net zero um, and hitting one and a half degrees from the Paris uh, Accord, ecosystem renewal, restoration, and of course eliminating plastics from our supply chain. The RBPF, our Responsible Investment Policy, is very focused and its objective is to make investment green, investments, our two billion pounds of investments green, and to make our environment uh, a better place. So we're looking to report openly with clear usable metrics and methodology, educating the two billion pounds of companies that we invest in. And if they don't deliver, if they don't meet up to those objectives and actually cause a problem, then we can divest from them and sell them on and put our money in better businesses. So here are a few of the things that we can do. It's a strategy for this borough and it offers great hope. So I would suggest, please, on the 4th of May, vote for myself and my wife, Carol De Costa. So De Costa and De Costa, you have two votes. We intend to be working with the new administration. We're going to be setting credible targets and metrics for net zero, for climate change resilience, for biodiversity restoration and ecosystem renewal, and for the elimination of plastics. We will drive change directly through RBWM and indirectly through what we can influence. And we will look to change the corporate plan, change planning policy, raise grants for residents and local businesses, empower residents and local businesses, tighten the responsible investment policy at the Royal Berkshire Pension Fund, and really importantly, report our results openly. We're in this together, and together we can. So we will collaborate with you. This is our mission. Thank you for listening.